Good afternoon. How are you? Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I'm pretty good. Uh, I'd ask how you were, but I think I know it's Singapore Grand Prix time and Red Bull have got a new front wing on their car. Let's take a quick look at the changes they've made to the front wing. The bits we're looking at are just here. It looks like they've taken a little bit of a cutting tool to an existing front wing. To explain those changes, let's get back to Paul. A couple of upgrades. Um, there's a a subtle upgrade to our front wing. We've been able to sort of do a make from on that one, which has been really good. Picked up a little bit of load, so that's nice to have. Um, the other change we've got is a kind of redistribution of the cooling exits. It's always difficult to release the cooling air from the top body without damaging your downforce. So we're just playing trades again, and it's um, it's a not quite a make from, but we've left some bits of the top body alone to be able to do this one. So we've got it here. It's quite pleasantly warm. Might rain in a moment, so. Uh, we could get a drenching, but yeah, we've got that and that should take us through to the end of the year now. Well, that brings me really nicely to the big topic of the Singapore Grand Prix weekend. A heat hazard has been declared perhaps a little bit early by the FIA. What is a heat hazard? Well, it means it's a bit hot and the drivers aren't particularly comfortable in the cars for a two hour race. The temperature is likely to exceed 31 degrees centigrade on Sunday, which means that there's a few subtle rule changes to ensure the drivers are as comfortable as possible in their cars, which is not something we normally talk about here on Tech Talk, driver comfort is pretty low on the list of a Formula One car's design, is that the cars can be fitted with a driver cooling system. And you can see sometimes the drivers are wearing the cool shirts and you'll see it all the way through this weekend. We'll get into how that works in a moment, but throughout the free practice sessions and all the way through qualifying, to accommodate that extra system, the FIA increased the minimum weight of the cars by two kilograms. For the Grand Prix on Sunday, the minimum weight is increased by five kilograms, but that doesn't mean that the drivers have to use the cooling system. They just have to have the weight in the car where the cooling system would be if they don't use it. And if the cooling system is lighter than that five kilos on Sunday, they just have to ballast it up to that five kilo weight. To explain a little bit more about how the system works, let's get back down to Paul Monaghan in the pit garage at Red Bull. So the driver cooling system, is, we, we can, circulate cold water on the driver's vest in little hoses. The idea is we can take the heat out of his core and then reject it into a, um, what we call a thermal store, which is located in the car. That's basically an ice block. And you put a heat exchanger coil in there. So the, the vest water goes into that coil, which is immersed in ice, or a bit of a slu like a slush puppy, slops around on it using the car's motion. And you take the cold water and shove it back in the vest and circulate it around him. Simple as that. Well, the cooling system for the drivers is relatively new into Formula One. It was introduced after all of those problems at Qatar and a few other races a few years ago, where we saw drivers like Lance Stroll really struggling at the end of the Grand Prix with heat exhaustion. And really, it was becoming a little bit of a risk for the drivers to drive in those conditions. As I say, it doesn't look to be that hot in Singapore, but it's very humid, and this is the longest race of the year. So the team engineers have to find ways to keep the car cool for the drivers, keep the cockpit cool. Now one of those methods is to have a little hole in the front of the car. You can see Red Bull's version here. Now they've got interchangeable parts at the very tip of the noses on both Yuki Tsunoda's and Max Verstappen's cars. And you can see just on this image here, you can just see where that panel is interchangeable. It's got a bit of tape over on it here, but the swap it out very quickly in the pit lane. If they feel that the session's gonna to get too hot, they can put in a blanking plate and that improves the aerodynamic flow over the front of the car as well. Now, notably, Red Bull are one of those teams that keep the driver's drinks bottle in the tip of the nose, basically inside this void here around the front impact structure, there is a tank for the driver's drink system. And the driver presses a button back in the cockpit and it squirts the uh, drink into their mouth as they drive around during the Grand Prix. I've always wondered about that because if Red Bull have a little bit of a boo-boo on the opening laps of the race, then the driver's drink system has to be taken off when they change the nose. There's a quick release uh, element at the tip of the front bulkhead that allows them to do that. But what I've always wondered is do they fill up all of the spare noses in the pit garage in case of that situation. My feeling is that they don't. Why does that matter? Well, having a couple of kilos of drinking fluid at the front of the car right at the beginning of the race moves the weight distribution, which don't forget in Formula One is quite strictly limited, towards the front of the car. As the fuel goes down in the central section of the car and the driver sweats out some fluid as well, 
the weight in the center, central section of the car goes down. So the driver can drink the fluid and it moves that weight essentially slightly away from the nose towards the center of the car. A little bit of weight distribution play, I think, totally within the regulations and a rather smart bit of engineering. Racing balls, I think, have the same arrangement. Most other teams have the driver's drink system behind the driver's seat, but some of us are migrating to this solution as well. So smart thinking, Red Bull have done that for years. Now looking at the front of the cars up and down the pit lane, you'll see different solutions to the cooling slot in the nose tip. Not every team is using them. Here's Ferrari's design. They have that open at pretty much every race, regardless of where we are. I think it's very stylish, that one. Uh, McLaren have turned up with both open and closed versions on their noses in the pit lane. You have the open version there and the closed version there, but also with that interchangeable panel that we saw on Red Bull, most teams have that, to be able to change what they're doing as they go out on track. Some teams, though, have a few other issues. Mercedes, they have a little nice little grill on the tip of the car. Gone are the days, though, where teams would have their logo put into the driver's cooling slot in the tip of the nose. I think that's a bit of a shame, but weight is so important in this generation of car. Alpine, they don't have a slot in their spare nose, but they did have one on track as well. Racing Bulls, they've got a lovely little 3D printed tip of the nose there just to go into that cooling slot. But take a look at Aston Martin. On the tip of their nose in use at the Singapore Grand Prix, it's very difficult for them to actually be able to get a cooling slot in there because as you can see, the front wing has a central support just where you'd put that cooling slot. So that's not really an option for Aston Martin. So they've taken advantage of another area of freedom in the technical regulations. At these hotter races or when they decide they want to do it, they can open up this cooling slot on the front and the top of the chassis. Now, all teams are allowed a single cooling slot in this area. And I've always wondered, looking at the design of this Aston Martin version, it looks fairly simple. But when you look at versions like the Mercedes, you can see it's quite a large humped section and there's been some speculation about that hump because they have it on the car all the way through the year, whereas Aston Martin only put this slot on when they need to cool the car down. So there's some speculation that teams might be using it to get a little bit of an extra aerodynamic advantage. And we put that question to a couple of teams in the pit lane. Uh, honestly, no, it's, it's a well-prescribed system in, in the way it needs to work and the way it needs to operate. So there's no aerodynamic advantage. That's a good question. No, no, we haven't uh, exploited that. Well, that's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Because I don't think there's any element of a modern Formula One car that the designers and engineers don't think about in great detail, not just to make it as light as possible, but every single part of these cars is designed to make the car slightly faster. So I do struggle slightly with somebody saying they haven't thought about when you've got a new bit of the regulations that allows you to have a duct in the front of the car, even though it's in a relatively insensitive bit of the front of the car in terms of the aerodynamics, I struggle to believe that they don't look at that as a way to get a bit of an advantage. And the reason I think that, I'm gonna get us back down to Red Bull because at the front of the Red Bull, on most of the recent designs they've had, you've seen these two ducts at the front of the car, just on the number 22 there of Yuki Tsunoda. And these two ducts, for me, are, I think, slightly interesting because the rules say you're allowed a single duct in that area for driver cooling. And that's what Aston Martin has got, for example, a single duct that they use to cool the driver at certain hot races. Red Bull, on the other hand, have these two ducts open at every single Grand Prix. Hot or cold, those ducts are always on the car. The, no the duct on the tip of the nose, they don't always have, but these two are always there. And it's fascinated me for some time. So we asked Paul Monaghan what those ducts are all about and is there an aerodynamic advantage coming from those parts? Well, they were allowed those as driver cooling inlets after the debacle of 23. I'd been asking, can we have chassis cooling inlets? No, 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 we can't. We're blocked by some of my chums not far away. After that, we said, well, yeah, come on, we'll put them in. They are an enormous benefit because it exchanges the air through the cockpit of the car for us. Um, so we just fit them and just get on with it now. Well, isn't that an interesting answer? Paul Monaghan never fails to disappoint, does he? Um, draw your own conclusions about that ducting then. Does it offer an aerodynamic advantage? Does any team on the grid use that driver cooling system, not the driver's suit, but the actual ducts in the nose, to actually purely cool the driver? Hmm, I'm not entirely sure. Yes, the regulations say that's what it's for, but you know, 
they also say that brake ducts must be for brake cooling only. And if you look at an episode we did on Tech Talk recently, you'll see they generate quite a bit of downforce. So for me, every element of Formula One is about making the cars go faster. And uh, this is just another example. Whether it's Red Bull, Aston Martin, or any of the other teams on the grid, it's a fascinating area of engineering. And these designs, these ducts on the top of the noses are all so different from team to team. And that's what we love to see here on Tech Talk.